Hi, I'm Karen Golden Aronte here at Cohasset Historical Society with lifelong resident of Cohasset, Glenn Pratt. How are you today? Fine. Great. Thank you for having me. Well, Glenn, I have to really dig very deep in Cohasset's history to find out the lineage of the Pratt family in Cohasset. So Cohasset was settled in 1647 and then it was part of Hingham um, until it became a um, second district of Hingham in 1717, of which your family was already here because Aaron Pratt purchased land in Cohasset in 1683. So he was the first of this very long line of Pratt's here in town. He was, yes. Great, so now that we get those dates <laughs> out of the way, <laughs> um, let's start with your family, your you know, your, what you remember as a child growing up here in Cohasset? Well, we, <laughs> uh, we uh, most of the years growing up, uh, uh, lived on Sawyer Street. Uh, my folks had an apartment on Beechwood Street uh, when I was born, uh, back in the late 40s. And uh, the town, uh, our family, probably there was... Um, uh, seven or eight uncles and aunts and all the cousins that, that went along with them were, were living here at the time and we all uh, seem to have grown up together and now we're, now we're scattered everywhere but um, you know like a lot of people will say Coasa was a much different place uh, was lots of family it was a simple life it seemed um, we didn't uh, know that this wasn't the way the rest of the world really was mm -hmm. you know? and uh, so I, I think that's so now, so you grew up, how did you get around? Did you ride your bicycle around? Yeah, sure, or? we, we uh, you know, uh, ride your bicycle around. Um, it wasn't that hard to walk to the places you'd want to go anyway, mm -hmm. which was the cove and downtown and like that. But one of the things that kids uh, always were vying for was to get a used bicycle um, from Bill Poland's Jenny Station. Uh, in the 50s and in the, in the 60s, the music circus had permanent party um, singers and dancers uh, here all summer, uh, renting rooms from local families, and they rode, they had bikes, that's how they got around. And uh, we used to call them English bikes in those days because they had uh, brakes on the handle handlebars. Mm. And, uh, so at the end of the season, Poland, Mr. Poland, would sell the bikes for $25. Uh, so everybody would get on a waiting list, hoping that it would be your year to get your new $25 bike from Bill Polis gas station. Mm. And so that was, the, that was the highlight of getting around. And of course, you know, I suppose it's no different today once you close in on 16 with the license. Yeah. Now, of course, you don't have a car, but you have a license. So that's how we got around, just walking, you know. Um, mm. uh, you know, the high school and, and the elementary schools were exactly where they are today. So walking to them from where we lived on Sawyer Street was very easy. Mm -hmm. And that's what was done. Uh, the quick way to get down to the village was down the railroad tracks, of course. You know, um, today they have it all fenced off. You can't do that. There's really a train there it's, today. There's really a train, yeah. Well, no, there was, there was a train. We yeah. Up. Um, the, uh, the uh, yeah, the trains were always running when we were kids. Um, so it was, a, it was a really a commuter train for people to get train, to Boston. It was a commuter train, and uh, I remember um, uh, my father and my uncle Bert Pratt uh, took us kids on the last train out of Cohasset to Greenbush in 1959, we got on to Cohasset Station, rode to Greenbush, and uh, my mother picked us up and drove us all back. Hmm. So, 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 and then and then there was freight trains for some years after that. Yeah, uh, I remember. Yeah, always. So I do have your Tessa Hawk yearbook yeah, here. Yeah. You know, I, w I always wondered when they started with the name Tessa Hawk because it used to be called the Piper. The Piper, correct. The Piper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, and here we'll, we'll we'll show your picture of the class of 1965. We just had our 50th reunion this summer, mm -hmm. uh, and one of our events was held here at the the Pratt Building. Um, at the, um, but we had in our class, which was the largest class to the time, uh, there was 100, 117. Wow, and that was the largest class up until that time. And at our reunion this summer, 50 years on, uh, we were able to get 52 classmates here. Wow. So that was, we thought awesome. that, was, that was very good. Um, but yeah. So after graduating in 65, then where did you go and where did you pursue? So, so uh, 
uh, my uncle, one of my uncles owned a uh, manufacturing facility that made um, doorknobs. And uh, so my father thought it would be a grand idea if I uh, uh, went to, to um, work with him and go to uh, uh, you know, mach machine school um, at night, which I did, but then realized that, that wasn't going to be it. So I um, went off and uh, uh, did some coursework at Northeastern, and um, you know, as the 70s came around, um, uh, got into the uh, janitorial business, and I've uh, been doing that in one form or another uh, for 40 something years now, wow. so yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, always, you know, lived here and, and around Cohasset. There's always those years where you scoot out of town because you're a college kid, you know, mm -hmm. like that. And then there's the, um, the time that you, uh, you're in the Army, so you're not here for that. But, uh, but every other, the rest of the time, I've been right in and around town here somewhere. I've lived in the same house now for 40 years uh, on King Street. Classic. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So your involvement is very wide in town here. <clears throat> and so it, the list is very long. So mm -hmm. let's start with what you've begun. Well, hopefully you have the list that we can work off I of. I do, okay. yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Chronological order, okay. but it's very long and they do overlap. Mm -hmm. okay. So, but the first thing which is, which is really very, was pretty awesome and, and certainly every Memorial Day, the town of Cohasset is really very pr a very proud town when um, the veterans walk a Memorial Day parade. So you were involved with the Veterans Memorial Committee. Well, we did. We, in, in 1969, uh, five Cohasset uh, kids, our friends, uh, were killed in Vietnam. So we thought that it would be appropriate if we got going on some sort of a memorial, and we uh, got the selectmen to put a group of us together as a town committee, Veterans Memorial Committee, and we got to work on ideas and uh, came up with building the first part of what's now called Veterans Park at the harbor. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, uh, we were into the 1969 town meeting and got $6,600 to, to build the first memorial. And we have been, uh, our group, um, some of us have been the same, same people on the committee for uh, 40 years. Uh, we have kept uh, bringing up and developing new ideas for veterans memorials in town. And today, we have a Gold Star Mothers Memorial. We have parks named for each of the servicemen who uh, died in the wars in Cohasset. Um, we have uh, the big uh, veterans park at, at the harbor, which lists everyone in Cohasset who served during any of the war years, starting with the uh, starting with the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we uh, will keep going with the idea as as we get and see more ideas about veterans and ways of remembering, we'll try to do it. So this shows um, the, oh it, it, yeah, with it, this is a, this is the park that was after the uh, fire station was torn down. Right, the park is where that fire station building was, correct. Um, and so some group, I, I would suspect was one of the garden clubs, got together and started to develop the, the vacant lot where the building was torn down. And uh, there was a little commemorative stone there that uh, talked about veterans, and that's what we expanded on uh, yeah. as we went along over the years. So. Sorry, I'm falling apart here. So the Veterans Park that um, th then you carried over into the Central Cemetery for more um, veterans recognition, though, after... Um, well, we, we, uh, we, we did the park in uh, 69, and then uh, it was some years later when we went ahead and dedicated and developed squares around town for the men who had died in Korea and Vietnam, and we did a big celebration in 1996 on that. And then in 2001, we built a fairly elaborate memorial to the Gold Star Mothers mm -hmm. um, at the Woodside Cemetery in Cohasset. Then we followed on very soon after that in 2006, uh, developing, uh, building out the rest of Veterans Park with a uh, large memorial for the uh, servicemen uh, for Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, and the War on Terror. The War on Terror is still going on, and we add names to that every year. Twice a year, we add names of um, Cohasset men and women that are on active duty. So oh. um, it's kept up. and. 
the park is um, all inclusive, like I said, of every veteran since the Civil War. Uh, there is a one of the things on our plate is to figure out how to recognize the uh, servicemen from the Revolution. Um, we're trying to figure out how to do that. There is a uh, uh, Medal of Honor winner buried in Cohasset, Cohasset man, uh, Levi Gaylord. So we'd like to get him some recognition there also. So we got a few things still going on with veterans memorials. Mm. Um, all, all donated money. I mean, we we ask for money uh, when we're doing something, and uh, pretty much always round it up. Well, it's. It, yes. What has come of this has been very impressive and certainly a proud point for Cohasset, for sure. So after you become in, uh, now that you're involved with the Veterans Memorial Committee, and then what was your next, well, you were still pursuing that, still on your plate, but what? Right. We, um, in the late 70s, uh, uh, there was a, there seemed to be a wave of um, young men on the planning board in Cohasset. Uh, there was myself, there was Wayne Sawchuck, there was a fellow named Mark Goodrich, all of us young in our 30s, and, and, and um, even the other members who were on there, I suspect, were in their, in their early 40s. So there was a period of time in the late 70s where uh, the planning board was uh, a younger group, so we were on there for a while. Um, very different time for the planning board because there was actually time to think and plan not like today's schedule where every week they're just, you know, constantly dealing with, you know, application after application for some sort of development. Mm. So we uh, thought through a lot of things and changed bylaws and, you know, uh, notified the selectmen that it appeared the town was going to run out of cemetery burial space and uh, did things like that. So, so that was in the, in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also a time that uh, uh, I was on the personnel board. There was a personnel board in those days, and uh, which I suppose is like a human resource department now, uh, but that was a short lived, and I don't remember accomplishing anything significant there, so, <laughs> so I, I don't know. Um, and um, so, one of the things that we did on the planning board was notify the selectmen that we're about to run out of cemetery space. That was probably in 1978. So in the early 80s, uh, the selectmen appointed a committee to figure out what to do about the dwindling cemetery space. And I served on that committee for 20 years before we were able to get a solution, um, find a solution, get it funded, and get it built, which was the uh, addition to Woodside Cemetery, so-called Gold Star Mothers section. Uh, but 20 years was a long haul to... Uh, to get that done, now, the town, at that time, the town was down to only 50 burial slots, only 50 places that someone could have bought to be buried. And the town, so th I didn't realize that there are six cemeteries in, in there are, town, there are. Central Cemetery being private, private. Private, yes. Could you highlight the other? So, so, so the town cemeteries, are the, the, uh, the oldest is um, a section of Beechwood. Which, from beat, the, which they, the they, town bought in like the 1700s. Very, very far back in the 17, early 1700s. Um, then there is Woodside Cemetery, which was developed in 1906 from land that they acquired from mm -hmm. Mr. Whitney. You always hear, of, there are a lot of things named Whitney in town. There's, it used to be called Whitney Hill, which is where uh, the Avalon mm -hmm. apartments are yeah. now. And then there's, uh, you know, the Whitney, uh, Mr. Whitney gave the land where the golf club is now. and. Uh, uh, Mr. Whitney also provided the land for the town uh, in 1906 to uh, develop the new cemetery, Woodside. And um, one of the, one of, I'm not sure the timing, but one of the, some of the earliest burials there are uh, relocated um, bodies from um, the old poorhouse, the oh, um, Pond the Street Pond Cemetery. Street, Pond Cemetery was most moved Which, over there. Right. Uh, how accurate the records are on that, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there's another very, very old cemetery right in the middle of the golf course called the Cedar Street Cemetery, which dates back to the early 1800s. Um, certainly there's no graves available for sale there. But 20 years ago, probably, we convinced the golf club to have their grounds people take care of it. And that's why it's, it's kept very nice. And it's an interesting feature of, of the golf club. And then there is another cemetery, which is town owned, but it was a private cemetery uh, called Greengate Cemetery, which is way over uh, in, in the, in the uh, high numbers um, 
on Jerusalem Road, almost over to what we call West's Corner. Um, very nice, uh, well endowed, uh, you know, uh, kept up by the town. So those are the five town cemeteries. And then the Central Cemetery, which is on Main Street, uh, is owned by a private cemetery association. Um, been there way back into the uh, late 1700s. Um, and the association is uh, very active, has a 25 member board. Uh, they have space available in, in niches that they've, that they've built over the years. Um, I'm on that board there also, mm -hmm. curiously enough. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there are six places in town. And now the town, since we did the additions to the cemeteries in, in the early 2000s, uh, there are probably 3,000 graves available now, which is good. That should last us quite a while because we don't bury many more than 60 or 70 people a year in Cohasset. So. We should be good. Hmm. Um, so that's the cemetery story. Wow. Um, and um, then, um, for some reason or other, uh, some some people, led by a fellow named Joe McElroy, uh, got the idea to uh, restore one of the light keepers' uh, residences um, down at the harbor. There, there were it two. Was pretty it was it pretty was, dilapidated. It was totally dilapidated. Yeah. There was one apartment that was still being rented by the town, but mm -hmm. it wasn't very habitable. So anyway, uh, this this idea was to lease it from the town, renovate it, put income-producing apartments on the second floor in a, in a function hall, a, a place for functions um, on the first floor, and uh, thinking that it would be a big seller because the view you can't beat. And uh, so we got to work on that in, in, in the early 90s. That took us a couple of years, raised the money for that, um, got it done, and um, the place is terrific. You know, and they, oh, on their literature, they say you can't beat the view. And it's you can't. True. If, if you're somebody here for a wedding from Kansas City or something that's never seen the ocean, yeah. and that's it's, your first glimpse. It's quite yeah. spectacular. Spectacular. So that was. That was a great project, and it was, uh, and it's been successful. That's a nonprofit. Um, it's been been going on um, for all these years. And then there was the, you know, like so many young parents uh, of the time, you get involved in the community center. Right. The community center, you know, has been a organization that's been going a nonprofit since 1943. Had its ups and downs, and it was on one of its. Uh, <laughs> at one of its low points in the early 80s. And uh, so myself and, and a lot of other young families got involved. Uh, we, we, we got on the board, we got moving, we um, grew up the nursery school program, grew up the gymnastics program, built a big addition and a nursery school onto the building um, in, in, the mid, in probably 1986 or something like that. We. Um, in 1986, the selectmen had an idea for this new, this new thing that was coming around in towns called senior centers, and they asked if we, the board of the community center, could give them a space for that. And they've been in the room over there for 30 years now. Uh, and the new addition. The, they were in a little room, then they built the addition mm -hmm. on, and and um, uh, they had the idea that uh, they would raise the money to put an addition on the community center for their use. Uh, and they did. They raised the money, and the exchange was that they would be able to stay there rent-free for 20 years. So that was in uh, 1991. 2011 came before you knew it, mm. and um, so now they're just about to move to, to their new place. Um, but the community center uh, was just a great, lively place full of activity. There was a time in, in the late 80s where we actually rented space across the street uh, on Depot Court, where the, where the restaurant Mr. Dooley's oh. is now because uh, we were bulging at the seams. Uh, there were so many things going on there. Well, the original <coughs> community center was actually the stucco building, the Ferber Correct. Estate up right. at on um, Sawyer Street Sawyer and Street. North Main. Yeah. Yeah. And they were going to raise, uh, actually, they were going to raise the community center that, that we know now right. to build a big A&P. That would have been a scary... That would have been a thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. How, it's nice. How it would have been a 7-Eleven now, yeah. probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, the... Uh, when they that when they got that building, that needed some renovations also, and a hall to be built onto it. And uh, so the the big funding for the hall, the big addition, was from the McElwain family. Um, the the um, the 
McElway family is in town today are the Wakemans, who a lot mm -hmm. of us know, uh, Sam Wakeman and uh, um, Tim Davis and his wife and them. Uh, so that's why it's called McElwain Hall. And, uh, you know, Franklin McElwain uh, was one of the founders of the big conglomerate um, and corporation that we know today as CBS. Uh, so that was really the beginning of that little drugstore with them. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, and, and even till today, they still call that McKell Wayne Hall. And they were also the ones who funded the bowling alleys in the basement. Yeah, which the bowling alleys. We uh, all was supposed to vent young person's yeah, energy. They do, right. And they, they um, the bowling alleys were there. And then sometime along in the late 60s, they got a used, uh, some used bowling pin setting equipment from a, from a uh, bowling alley in Hall that was closing down. So now they have automatic, hmm. you know, modern pin setters there. It's only fifty years old, but yeah, you see, it still uh, works. But it was, yeah. The place was, uh, it was, it was when we were kids. When we were in high school. It was just hopping. Everybody went there in the afternoon, and because uh, you were bowling, and there was a big billiards table there, and a jukebox, and you know, Elvis Presley playing, mm. something like that, whatever. So it was very lively, and, and, it, and it, you know, it, it, you know, sloped down. And so in the early '80s, it was on one of those down mm. places. But we got it going. We got it pumped up, and today I think it's as good as ever. Yeah, it, it does, is. and it sponsors a lot of town activities, it which does. is you know, town-wide yeah. activities, right. which is really yeah. very nice. Yeah. So um, we'll show during the interview some of the older photographs of the community center, and uh, they're really quite interesting because the views from where the, this one particularly, I think, is quite amazing. Where you know the well, the barn and the yeah, the yeah. barn, which is now mm -hmm. the park. Mm -hmm. So we'll show those up yeah. front, close. Yeah. After I drop all my photographs on the floor, but anyway, so after the community center, well, then the community center was a long time. We were probably involved in that board for 10, 10 or twelve years. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was always going on. Uh, uh, you know, um, somewhere along to the end of the nineties. I w was appointed and then was elected for a number of terms to the Water Commission. Mm -hmm. The Water Commission um, uh, is established because the water system doesn't serve the whole town, so it can't be can't be funded through taxation. So, so the Water Commission elected board. Um, I got on there because uh, I was very interested in uh, helping solve the problems. Uh, the water department had kind of been in the family. My father was the superintendent for 22 years before he retired. And uh, so when the water system broke in um, Memorial Day of 1996. Can you explain what broke means? Broke means that people who live on the far end of Jerusalem Road, Linden Drive, um, Deep Run and that way there, they turned on their faucets and no water came up. Mm. Very scary situation and very dangerous um, for not just for safety but for a lot of variety of health reasons. So the system was, was broken, there's no two ways about it. And um, so the first thing to do was how to get a quick fix in and the quick fix was put a water main down to uh, Forest Avenue so you could loop, loop the system and feed more. And then uh, after study, it was found that just almost every place in town, the pipes were just too small to service the demand, to serve the development that had gone on uh, over the years. So the, uh, the town meeting was quite clear, uh, said to the commission, look, figure out what's wrong, see what the solution is, and tell us how much it's gonna cost. So the board set out to do that. Um, that was, that was going on just a little before I got on there. Um, and it turned out that the fix was going to take 10 or 15 years and cost $30 million. Uh -huh. um, it was done. Um, much of the time I was on the board. I was on the board for 12 years during that time. Uh, the system was fixed. It's the class of water system now is the envy of many, many communities, not just because our distribution system is new. Mm -hmm. Water systems routinely are 100 years old or more, you know, and when you have a water system whose average age is less than 20 years, which is what ours is now, um, it's the envy. And Cohasset's uh, water source, we have, we, our watershed, which is all the area that we collect water, uh, produces five million gallons of water a day. Um, we keep 330 million gallons a day in our reservoir. The 
Friedman, L- Lily Pond. No, the reservoir at the end of Beechwood Street. Oh, okay, the reservoir, okay. We, the plant, the facility can treat and process um, three million gallons a day. And I would guess on a day like today, which is cold and rainy and 50 degrees, the water department didn't probably sell 600,000 gallons today. So the envy of, of uh, many water districts, which is, which is a great place to be. Uh, we actually worked out a, worked out a deal um, that we sell up to 300,000 gallons of water a day to the big Linden Ponds retirement community in Hingham. So that, that was a great source of um, revenue and for the department. So we did that, and I was on that commission for um, 12, 12 years, uh, or, or a little more maybe. So um, n- now towns like Hingham, they don't own their own water department. No, right. They, they yeah, they sold so, the thing. The, the, the Cohasset Water Department was purchased in 1950 mm-hmm. um, by, by the town. It was owned by a private company up until that time. Um, so some towns do, and some towns they don't. Yeah. They don't. Um, you know, Cohasset's water system today is it's managed and operated every day by a private contractor, um, but the elected board runs it, and makes the decisions. And so, can you can you tell us about the reservoir and how that came to be? So, so, so uh, back in the uh, uh, late '60s, early '70s, there wasn't supposed to be enough so there wasn't enough water to mm-hmm. even put in these pipes that were too small. You right. know, and, the pond would get uh, very, very low, and they had trouble pumping water out of it, and there was water bands all the time. And so the Water Commission at that time set about to find out how they could solve that problem. And the solution was build a reservoir, dam, dam the uh, Aaron River, build a reservoir, and build a new treatment plant. Prior to that, there was a treatment plant way off of Beechwood Street, up behind Lily Pond. I uh, had been there since the late 1800s. Um, and there was a couple of wells on Sawyer Street near where the new senior center is. And uh, that was the story. So, so, so the project was engineered and developed. Uh, it was going to cost $3.3 million, a staggering sum mm. for the time. And it was to be the largest public works project the town of Coasset had ever undertaken. So the town voted for it, borrowed the money from the... Uh, Farmers Federal Farm Home Administration Agency, and uh, set out to build an earthen dam, big 800 foot long earthen dam. Um, much of the, the area where the water is is not even in Cohasset. People don't realize that it's in Wampatuck Park, which is which is state property. Uh, so there's a very complicated uh, you know use agreement with the state on that, but it. Um, Holds 330 million gallons of water when it's full, and uh, it's a very long um, supply for the amount of water that we use every day. Mm-hmm. Plus, we have water coming in from the Peppermint Brook. Water comes in to Lily Pond, which is a totally separate um, reservoir source. So, the after the dam was built, it was thought that um, it could take as much as uh, three years for the reservoir to fill, and it turned out it filled up in 13 months. So. <laughs> It's a wet period. Yeah, you know, that's impressive. The whole business of water is all about the weather. Mm. You know, it's as simple as that. That's how you, you know, that's why your sales go up and down, and that's why your inventory goes up and down. It's, yeah. Well, there were times where Lily Pond would actually, yes, like be it, empty. It, right, and they would, and they would, they used to, they used to put pumps on mm-hmm. on little raft floats and push them out into the deeper part of the pond where there was still some water and pump it in. Yeah. Now Lily Pond today, the average depth is less than six feet. So it's it's a very shallow uh, pond, but they, they put the gates in it at Beechwood and Bound Brook. Bu- so that, that that controls the water when it's coming down from uh, that redirects the water coming from the new reservoir mm-hmm. to, to keep to come into the into the into the pond. So yeah. good. So Cohasset's fabulous in the water department. We, that's good. So yeah. We go, we're we're you know we're diligently paying off the mortgage, which mm-hmm. has got another probably uh, fifteen years to go. But you know, uh, people quick to talk about the high water bills but they weren't too interested in doing nothing when people had no water yeah and you can imagine they not didn't, didn't delight the fire chief that much either right <laughs> so, right but anyway but you know they they um one of the things about the water system people don't realize is that in the water quest has four million gallons in storage finished water drinking water in the two water tanks they have in town 
But of that four million gallons, 400,000 of it is just reserved for fire use in case there's a fire tonight. There's, they, there's 400,000 gallons that the fire department can use before it starts affecting people's houses and the, and the pressure in their houses. Wow. So, so there's a lot that goes into it. Mm. You know, yeah. um, so we did that. That, that took a while. Uh, so now the water, you, let's see, the water, and then you went on to where after the water? Well, let's see now here. Um, somewhere along the way, we got started with the um, uh, Beachwood Ballpark. Mm -hmm. uh, now that seems like that was in the 2004, 5, 6, somewhere along there. Beachwood always had a ballpark, um, yep. and everybody thought it was a great little sandlot pickup park, but it needed help. So It was we, truly a sandlot. It, it, it was, was a, a sand dirt lot, lot it was is a dirt really lot. what it was. Straightaway center field was nine feet higher than home plate, so <laughs> being the center field, it was a tough assignment running <laughs> yeah. uphill. Uh, so we, we uh, went to the community preservation uh, with the idea. Uh, they funded, funded it, town meeting funded some also. And it took three years uh, and a million dollars, but we transformed the Beachwood Corner. Uh, what, what, you know, right. Some of the people call it Beachwood Corner. There's the ballpark there, there's, a, there's um, the uh, basketball court, the play park for the kids, uh, mm -hmm. there's a building, there's a little there's restrooms there. So it's, it's quite, quite a good improvement for that. Vast improvement, because yeah, it yeah. was really yeah. pretty dilapidated. It was, and the thing I think that surprised, surprised me and surprised a lot of people is that how much use it gets now that it's there, mm -hmm. you know? You know, you, you, well, you'll never see kids, little kids there. Right. Put it on the no, doing it. The yeah. So we worked on that and we, we got that done. Uh, uh, we touched on the, um, the cemetery expansion in 2001. Um, that was a culmination of 20 years worth of working on a committee. We got that done. Um, and then there's we, the Cohasset Land Foundation. Well, the Cohasset Land Foundation. Now, there was a group that, uh, you know, and it kind of spun off of the group of people who worked on the uh, town master plan a number of years ago, uh, and they were still interested in preserving open space. So we started out, uh, it's not a new idea in many communities. Lincoln is the oldest example of how this is done. You know, you acquire a big piece of open space, sell off just enough for development to pay the cost, and then you put the rest of it into open space. So we came across a uh, 40, some just over 40 acre parcel um, off of Beechwood Street. We were able to, to buy it, sell three house lots, and the rest uh, has been um, sold to the uh, Quest Conservation Trust. Um, and uh, so now it's a 25 acres is, is preserved open space there, uh, which could have easily been development. And does that have a name? It's called the uh, George Ingram Park. We bought the land from Ozzy Ingram, who's kind of a, uh, a name around town for years and years. He was a great, great old gentleman. Um, and he was interested in good community things. And mm -hmm. so when we talked to him about this, he was, he was very interested. And uh, unfortunately, he died before we got it done. But we named it for his father, which is what he had asked, uh, named the open space after my father, George, George Ingram. Um, so that project, I, I guess that might have taken us seven or eight or ten years to get, get done also. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, that's an active nonprofit now. We still look for opportunities all the time. We just, in, in the last two months, we've looked at a couple of, couple of pieces of open space to see uh, what could be done. And if it's not something we can do, we try to, we try to partner up with the Conservation Trust uh, or, or Community Preservation or something like that to keep it open. One so of the, well, on open space, one, one of the big accomplishments that we did on the Water Commission also during my time was that um, we bought 400 acres of land behind Lily Pond. So pretty much everything on the, uh, on the uh, west side of King Street uh, as you go from the Stop and Shop out to Beachwood is preserved open space forever now. It's 800 acres uh, for Whitney Woods, 400 acres the water department owns, 3,000 acres in one protect park. So there's a wow th that that's going to stay. Um, and and the conservation trust has some land up in and through there. Anybody too. can meander through any yeah, of those spaces there. Everything's open wow. spaces. The trails are there. And yeah, so we, nice. Yeah, so so that was another big thing we 
had going on in the Water Commission in addition to rebuilding the system. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so the Land Foundation, actually, I jumped off a little bit. Yeah. On that, but, um, so yeah, so we look at any opportunity to see whether we can help preserve, preserve space. And, uh, so that's been good. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Let's uh, see. Well, there's the Director of Emergency Management. So, Director of Emergency which Management. Everybody, which we need now. You know, um, we, so for years, uh, it was called civil defense, and then, and then it got changed over to emergency management. And uh, there was a there was a gentleman in town, Arthur Leah, who had been in town forever, and spent eighty years of his life involved with Boy Scouts. And so he was the uh, civil defense director, and he never bothered much changing the title because uh, that's what it was. And uh, so after nine eleven, um, there was a lot of federal requirements coming down on the towns and uh, things that had to be done. And, Arthur Leo was a gentleman in his 80s, and uh, he he just said to the to the selectman, "Listen, you know, I I'm, I'm happy to have this title, but I, I need help." So they asked me if I would help him out, and uh, so I did. And then he eventually um, um, resigned. He said, "You know, I'm not, I'm not I'm not doing anything, and the whole idea of having to have an email address is not my thing. So it's not, <laughs> it's not gonna go there." And uh, so we did. So we we. Uh, um, found ourselves right in, in the beginning, uh, early on, um, with federal emergency management, mass use emergency management, um, pushing down more and more regulations, more and more requirements on the town, um, giving out grants to accomplish things so that we could be prepared. So I've done that for 10 years, um, and we have had a great uh, success there. We've built an organization. We have over 40 trained volunteers, which is called CERT team, um, that are trained to uh, do all sorts of things and help help the public safety people in any way. We are the f we are the only uh, CERT team in Massachusetts to be trained uh, and certified by um, the power company to go out and guard and watch uh, down power lines. Uh, usually, a, a fire truck or a police car is tied up watching a down line until. Edison can, can get here. But National Grid, the power company, uh, came and trained 28 of our people to do that. So that's a great help to the police and fire because now they don't have to tie up their mm -hmm. equipment like that. So we have, we have all those volunteers. We have built out uh, a full-blown emergency operations center in the basement of the Deer Hill School so that in an emergency, um, all of our decisions are made from there. All the town departments operate from there. Uh, it's a central point. Uh, we're in communication with um, MEMA, State Emergency Management. Um, and so we're we're um, we have spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars over the last uh, five or six years on generators and radios, and uh, you know building out this emergency center, uh, and building up our team. So we're we're feeling pretty confident that we can hold our own uh, for a while. But even in, <clears throat> bad, in bad winter months, having the opportunity for a warming place for people to go to that when the electricity is out. Right. We, uh, we have made improvements to Deer Hill School so that it is a, a good warming center or a cooling center mm. in the hot weather. Uh, it has been certified by Red Cross as a facility that they could run as a shelter. If you have a shelter running um, and you get above a certain number of participants that you need help, you, you need professionals, mm. you know, and that's where the Red Cross will come in and come in and help. So it's been certified, it's ready to go if we needed it for that. It is the, uh, it's the designated um, um, forward position for anything that FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, would have to send here. Um, that's where it comes, right there. Uh, it's our location for what we call a uh, emergency dispensing site. Public health worries about well, what if you had to vaccinate or you know, give medicine to the entire population of Cohasset within a 72 mm. hour period or something? How the heck do you do that? Um, so we've run drills at Deer Hill, the school has been laid out, uh, and you know, we know how we're going to do it. Now, whether anybody will come at three in the morning for their shot, I don't know, <laughs> but we're ready. Yeah. Um, so that whole whole um, uh, idea of civil defense has turned into an actual town department. Now we, we used to have a, a budget of $350 a year. Um, now we have we're around 40000 Some of that pays for things like the 
what people call the reverse 911, the mass notification. Mm. You get those robo calls. Which people rely on. We rely on those. Um, but that costs money. They're not mm. free. So we have those. We have um, contracts with generator companies. and So it's a real, it's, it's a real department that is hopefully capable of holding our own. Mm -hmm. uh, what, everybody talks about emergency management in relation to some weather event. Well, it might not be a weather event, you know. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we met just last week with the folks from uh, Sunrise, the assisted living, saying, okay, what, what do you do if you can't use your building? Well, you know, what, where are you going, what are you doing? And, you know, so we um, are always trying to figure out what, what do we do? You know, if, the, if that building had to be evacuated now, 5 o'clock Tuesday afternoon, well, where are they going and how are they getting there? And so we know that people look to government to help and so we want to be involved so mm -hmm. we're always training and drilling and like that yeah so Cohasset will be ready well you know yeah. if, it's a, if it's a big regional event uh, the help from higher levels of government goes to where the most people are mm. so we're pretty far down, <laughs> pretty far down the line yeah, yeah. you know and uh, that's why Situate and Hull they're very practiced and very well ready to deal with ocean flooding, you mm. know, because they know there's no help coming from anywhere, you know. So, <clears throat> um, then of course we uh, uh, started off with the idea of building a senior center. Mm. That started in well, 2007. Um, uh, the Council on Aging was starting to realize, you know, our, our leases, our free rent at the community center is coming up in a couple of years, so we started looking around. And we came across a piece of land that was owned by the water department on Sawyer Street. Uh, it was surplus to them because they had to abandon their drinking water wells that were there because of the railroad coming back. So through a series of town meeting articles and state legislature home rule petitions, we were able to uh, get some of that water department land, swap some of it with the, uh, the uh, abutting nonprofit Cohasset Swimming and Recreation Trust, put together a buildable lot for a building, uh, worked out an arrangement with the Swim Trust to share their parking lot, and everything was terrific. Then the recession hit, and the town said, we can't afford a senior center, so we're not going to do this. But the Social Service League, which is another nonprofit in Cohasset, mm -hmm. been doing good work since uh, 1912, stepped forward and said, hey, we'll pay for it. And uh, we'll we'll give it to the give it to you when we're done. So we set about all the things that had to be done to use some of the money from their Mary Hooper Trust um, uh, to build the building, raise money, get it completed, and finally, in um, so about a year ago, we, we got it finished. And uh, actually, on uh, next Friday, the 11th of December, 2015, <laughs> uh, the senior center is actually moving in there full time. Oh, so congratulations. It's a, it's a yeah, awesome. Tre tremendous step. Um, but it was a lot to it. You know, Mary Hooper was a woman who died in 1924, left money in her will to build a home for aged Protestant couples in Cohasset. Mm -hmm. and that was a little difficult to come up with. And so through a number of court cases and whatever, it was decided that a trust should be set up, which it was. And now all these many years later have gone by. The Hooper Trust is very substantial. And the Social Service League, where the trustees invested a big portion of that for the Coasset Seniors. And, and she had asked for it to be named after her she father. She wanted to be named for her father, Levi Wilkett. And right. That's why it's called Wilkett Commons. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite a story. Yes. And uh, it's been, um, been a long, long way, but it's... It's well, it's been it idea. was interesting because the Wilcutt family has been in Cohasset <clears throat> since 1717, so mm -hmm. the name was very popular for a long, long time. Right. right. So it's it's nice to see its print marked presence here right. that yeah. in yeah. black and white. Yeah. So so it's a it's a, it's a great thing. Um, now, unless you have something else on the list, well, there, now you're involved you know, in the Boy Scouts. Back the Boy now. Scouts, you know. I, mm -hmm. uh, you say, what are you doing your kid? Well, one of the things you do when you're not playing Little League is uh, be in scouts. And uh, in those years, the Coasset Troop 28, we always had 50 or 60 kids involved. Um, and we had a cabin, uh, a log cabin, uh, and a camp 
area up in um, where I park. Everybody thought it was in where I park, town land, but it was actually on land owned by the Barnes family. So, mm -hmm. uh, but so we we uh, did that. Um, I was an Eagle Scout. Uh, the year I became an Eagle Scout, there were seven other kids too that got the same very, very high number yeah. in, in one year. So we did that. And uh, so over the years, um, I've been asked to um, do different assignments with the, uh, with the council, Old Colony Council on their executive board of directors. Um, so I've done that, I worked on their capital campaign uh, a few years ago. We raised $3 million to improve our camp in Plymouth, Camp Squanto. And uh, we actually, we actually uh, share a little bit of space uh, with the Boy Scouts up at the Deer Hill School. Um, so yeah, they're always. You know, I'm always involved with them. It's That's, good stuff. Yeah, Scouting is good. It's really good. That stuff. is that yeah. is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, Pat, I've got to share one little story, Glenn, mm -hmm. in in researching your family tree, which, as I've explained, goes back an awful long way. Right. Because some people don't know that quarrying used to be very popular in Cohasset. At some point, it would be typical to see horses draw granite, and there was a granite quarry at the end of Mill Lane. And there was actually another granite quarry up, your great-grandmother, Zoe Pratt, Zoe Whitcomb Pratt, the land was her father's. And they found, they, well, there was a quarry up there and they found this beautiful pink granite that was like no other around. So much so that it became so popular that Louis C. Tiffany bought the land in the quarry, which I thought was a fabulous story. Um, but after they quarried out, after they took all of the quarry, that was that was the end of that. But actually, the that whole area up there at the end of um, Doan Street and Beechwood Street. So in 1941, when they took the the government took an awful lot, like a sixth of the land of Cohasset, all up there, dead ending Beechwood and Doan Street, taking homes, having the mo families moved. That that was a big taking up the property up at the, for the, for the, du for the depot up there and the... And, and they, and they, uh, they created a lot of small, uh, unusable lots of land when they did that too, all up behind Lily Pond and the class of assessors had a map page uh, for a long time called um, Owners Unknown. So uh, when we were buying all the land for the water department, we thought that if no one knows the owners, we might as well have it. So the town took a permanent domain uh, to, to clean up all those small parcels. Um, but they say that uh, the construction of that so-called ammunition depot, that government land, was a huge construction project, and it all went through Beechwood Street. It yeah. all was, was worked off of that end, yeah. But it was, <clears throat> it was <clears throat> the town dump was up there. On Doan Street. 126, I mean, there was a lot of acreage. And that so was... wasn't the, uh, the um, oh no, I'm sorry, the Boy Scout, the, the original Boy Scout cabin was in Whitney Woods uh -huh. before the, but um, yeah, the dump was on Doan Street. There were some locals like Merle Brown who could probably still go up and find that for you. Yeah. The old dump, <laughs> you know. Well, anyway, it's very fascinating mm -hmm. to, to, to read that story. So I had to share that with everybody. Um, but anyway, your, your life story in Cohasset is really very fascinating. What, what's more important is how much you've contributed to the town, which is really very commendable. And we, I appreciate it. I'm sure Thank you. many yeah. more people can appreciate it too. Well, it's all, it's all um, valuable and important, important things, I think, for the quality of life. And you know, one of the things that a, a lot of the projects I've worked on in town that are good quality of life things have been fueled and funded by the Community Preservation Group. You know, mm. that's just a wonderful law, you know, to have that kind of money available. Well, and of course, one of my passions, like yours, is this building here, um, the Historical Society. You know? It is. It's, it's what's inside these walls is, yes. it's so much it's fun to is. read yeah, up really on is. the, yeah. so, and by doing these interviews is a nice way to preserve the history of Cohasset and for people to, even when I look back at the ones that were done by Noel Ripley years ago, listening to stories, it was it, they're really mm -hmm. quite fascinating. Yeah. So hopefully, maybe in 75 years, someone's going to listen to our interview and say, "Wow, this wow, is yeah." <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, thank you so well, very much for coming today and having a conversation with me. Well, thanks for having me. Take I love care. It. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.